I'm going to start our services this morning. We got a few announcements here to take care of this morning. We want to remember to keep Paul Facemeyer in the prayer as he's having pain in his feet. Uh, pray for Ruth Clemens' brother, Blaine. He has been moved to Encompass for speech therapy, but uh, he's back in the hospital again for a month. And we want to pray for Judy Davis as she's dealing with health problems, and that's Paul and Ruth. Uh, and Lemon's daughter. Or remember Roy Clark, his family, and pray for them. Roy, Roy deals with his cancer, and he will have uh, chemo and radiation in February. Um, remember Paul Lemon, he's doing better. Uh, Janice Martin had cataract surgery Thursday morning and is recovering well. And Tanya. Uh, Karen Metz's niece and her husband, Raymond, are struggling with COVID. And Elvis and Ann will be traveling. Uh, I think they're leaving after the services this morning. Going to uh, Freed Hardman for a lecture. Is there anything else that needs to be announced there? Okay, remember all these people in our prayers and pray for safe travel for those who travel. And uh, good recovery for everybody else. And tonight we'll have a song service uh, at 6 tonight and tomorrow evening the youth in him in. Okay, okay, the youth Monday night merge as uh, Barbara Benson at 7. And the 6th through the 10th will be the FAQ lectures um, online or in person. Uh, that's all the announcements we have for today. Is there anything else on the things, uh, events coming up? All right. Mark won't be leaving the same. Turn over him. First song this morning will be 343. Take up your feet, oh. Thank 
The reading this evening will be from John chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. These words spake Jesus, and lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that, the, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. pray together. Our Father in heaven, I come before you throne of grace, Father, with thanksgiving and praise. Father, we praise you for your wisdom and power. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you, Father, for glorifying your Son, Jesus, for reconciling us to yourself through him. Father, we just pray that you would help each of us to to be the ambassadors that we need to be and the profitable servants in your kingdom that, that we might bring as many to know you to know the saving grace that can be had through Christ Jesus our Lord Father we, we just thank you for every blessing of life we thank you Father for loving us so much uh, pray, uh, thank you Father for sparing us uh, from any uh, hardships from the inclement weather that we've experienced recently. Father, we just pray that you would continue to, to bless us. Uh, Father, we pray for all men everywhere that you would, uh, your mercy and grace would be great to each one, Father, that, uh, that they might be led to repentance and acknowledge of the truth. Father, we pray your blessings upon uh, all those of your household, especially, Father, the elders, that God, the, the church, Father, according to your word, pray that you would bless them, give them courage and wisdom, Father. Father, we pray for all those in seats of authority, that uh, you would bless and guide each one. Father, we pray that you would deliver us from evil in every high place, Father, that you would vanquish the enemies of Christ, Father, and bring them all into subjection under his authority. All these things, Father, we ask in Christ Jesus, our Lord, and that all of our Father, that your will be done. Amen. Five hundred and ninety-one. <coughs>
part of the little service where we have the Lord's Supper. We have a couple places in the Bible where it talks about what the sacrifice is and what it should truly mean to us. One of them being in 1 Corinthians. There's another one in, uh, I think, Mark or Luke. Uh, as we partake of these, let's remember the crucifixion and the sacrifice that Jesus has left for us. Let's offer prayer for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer this morning. We pray that you will bless this bread as it represents the broken body of Jesus being there on the cross. We pray that you will bless it and bless us as we partake of it. We pray that you will forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Give thanks for the fruit of the Lord. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to thee in prayer once again. We pray that you will bless this cup as it represents the blood that was shed. We pray that you will bless it and bless us as we partake of it. We pray that you will forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. There's baskets on the back table. If you haven't did your offering, you can do it as you choose. Next song will be number 332. Oh, man. 
Please be seated. Song of Invitation will be number 143 if you'd like to mark your book. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone. Certainly glad you are with us this morning. Brave the cool temperatures. I know it's six when I left my house this morning, but we are having a heat wave. My watch tells me it's now 25, so pretty soon it'll be in the 40s. So it's just like springtime. So it's good to see you out this morning. Certainly glad you come worship with us. Hope you are blessed for being here this morning. Uh, John chapter 17 is where we'll look at this morning for a few moments. John chapter 17. This is one of my favorite chapters and one of my favorite books because we see this recorded nowhere else with so many things in the life of Jesus. We'll see them recorded in more than one book. If it's in Matthew, many times it's in Luke and, and so forth. But John is kind of out here on his own on this one. Um, we see that Jesus' prayer in the garden and some other of the Gospels, but this prayer is different than the other prayers. The other prayers are mainly on if this, you know, if, if this cup, uh, or if it will, let this cup pass for me. In other words, you know, I really don't want to go to the cross, but if I actually have to go to the cross, I'll go to the cross type thought. And, and so we see that a couple times in other um, Gospels, but here in John, we see something that's different. It's a long, in-depth prayer that between Jesus and God. And when we look at this, we, we, we see that there's encouragement there from Jesus to his disciples. And, and we know that the, as while the uh, in inclusion of the prayer in a farewell disclosure was common in Jewish and Hellenistic uh, literature, the prayer of Jesus in John 17 is unique because of who was offering the prayer, which was Jesus. And because of the setting of the prayer, and it was probably the garden, and now the one who offered the prayer, we know is Jesus, the Son of God, who came to the flesh to die, to suffer, and to die on the cross, in order that, that we might be saved. And he was about to experience this suffering and this death, and then be resurrected to depart to the Father and go and be with the Father. And so this prayer is an intercession on our behalf, it was not only for those immediately following Jesus in that day and time, in the first century, in those early centuries, but it's for the whole community of believers. And so we'll look at three things that we see from this prayer this morning, and, and we'll take a couple weeks at least to look at this prayer. We'll be looking at about the first, oh, three to five verses this morning. First thing we see is in John chapter 17, verse 1, it was this register a moment ago, Jesus spoke these words lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son might glorify you. And so as we see this prayer beginning, he lifts up his eyes, his posture to Jesus or to God and begins talking to God. This was a, the characteristic posture for prayer in that day. We see in John chapter 11 and verse 41 as as. Judas, or as Lazarus was raised from the dead, they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was laying. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. We see the psalmist would say in Psalms 123, verses 1 and 2, Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the, the eyes of a servant look to the hands of the master as the eyes of a maid to the hands of the, her mistress so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us so not only was it practiced by Jesus but it was also accepted posture among the Jews the tax collector, if you remember the tax collector, though was unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven in Luke chapter 18 and verse 13, Jesus addressed God as the Father and a word occurring six times in the prayer. And so Jesus acknowledged God's sovereignty, declaring the hour had come. And since the arrival of the Greeks, Jesus had anticipated 
that the impending hour, the hour was the appointed time for Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension to heaven, the time of the glorification. So this posture we see with Jesus beginning his prayer, talking to the Father, we had seen several places before. The time had come, John chapter 12 and verse 23, Jesus answered saying, the hour has come that, your son, that the Son of Man should be glorified. Well, we knew that he was going to the cross. We knew that he would die. We knew that he would be buried. And we were told that he would rise from the, the dead again. And so we see this pattern that we knew was going to happen. The time had come for this to happen. The time for the Son of Man to be glorified. So Jesus prayed that the glorification might take place. Now, although his prayer was for himself, it's nothing like a prayer that one might make for his own benefit. Jesus' petition was singular. Glorify your son. When Jesus prayed for the glor God to glorify him, he was saying, in effect, you will be done, your will be done, because every work by which his will was accomplished is to his glory. So not much different than his other prayers, where it says, not, not my will, but your will. But by glorifying Jesus, the Lord's will would be done. John chapter 12 and verse 27, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Jesus knew that he had come to this hour. He knew that he had come to the earth for this specific purpose. He knew that it was time. He knew the hour had come. He took his posture. He begins his prayer to, to God. John 8, verse 50, I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. John 5, verse 44, how can you believe who receives honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? And, and so as we see him begin his prayer, and he spoke these words and lifted his eyes to heaven, Father, the hours come, glorify your son for the purpose, for the purpose that your son might glorify you. Unlike most people, Jesus saw only the glory that is from the one and the only God. F.S. Bruce remarked this, the cross, as he knows it full well, is to be the vehicle of the glory. And he prays that may so accept it as to bring glory to the Father in turn. Well, not only did he lift his eyes to heaven, but one of the most important things that we see through this whole process is granting eternal life. That, that's kind of why we come here this morning, isn't it? Because we want eternal life. We know that we can get eternal life through Jesus. Notice verses 2 and 3 of, of John chapter 17. Jesus says this, as you have given him authority over all flesh. Now, now he's saying this prayer kind of in the third person by now. God had given Jesus authority, we know that. And he says, as you have given him authority over all flesh, kind of in the third person, that he, Jesus, should give eternal life to as many as you have given who him, Jesus. And then he prays a definition in verse 3, and this is eternal life that you might know the only true God. What was the problem in the Old Testament? They had a lot of gods, didn't they? We would call them false gods, and they wouldn't even, we wouldn't even give them a capital G, we'd give them a little g, and, and they had all these different gods that they worshiped. And, and, and so wouldn't you know that, that God Jehovah would say, he, 
here's the first part of eternal life. And if you don't get the first part of eternal life done, then, then we're in kind of trouble. But you need to know the true living God. Well, what's the second part? And Jesus, his son. And so we need to know God and Jesus, his son. Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us that, but without faith it is impossible to please him because we must believe that he is a rewarder, a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And so he's, we have to believe in God, believe in his son, Jesus Christ. And he says, you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life. So who's given eternal life? It's Jesus. He's granting eternal life. You and I, this God-given authority. We like when somebody gives us a little authority, don't we, to do something? And, and usually it's, it's, it, it might not be a big task, but especially when we're younger and, and someone gives us a little authority, oh, I got to do this. I can do that. But can you imagine God-given authority to give eternal life <coughs> God-given authority over all flesh. God-given authority over the human race for the purpose of granting eternal life to those who the Father has given to the Son. Now, when we think about this, those who the Father has given to the Son, really, that's those who, who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Father has given those to the Son. There's that relationship. And we back up and we look at verse 3 for a second. We see it. This is eternal life that, sh that you may know. We know a lot of people, don't we? You might say, well, I, I know the mayor of Parkersburg. Or I know somebody on the city council. Or, I, I know the school board. Maybe I know a, a congressman, or maybe I know a senator, or I, I know a famous movie star, or, or I know a basketball player. I remember when Shaq used to come into my store down in St. Mary, Florida, and, and big guy. You've probably seen Shaquille O'Neal on TV. He's six, seven, whatever, tall guy, and you'd see him coming. And he'd have to duck to get through the door. And he'd come in about once a week get an extra large pizza. I think it was for himself. You know, but I could say, I've met Shaq. I know Shaq. Well, do you know him? Well, what's his favorite color? I have no clue. Well, what does he like to do? I don't know. Did you meet him? Yes. Did you say, hi, how are you? Yes. What's our relationship with Jesus? Is it just a relationship where, where maybe we know of someone, we've met them, but, but we really don't know them? Now this word to know means to know in the deepest sense possible. So when I, I look at knowing God, I need to know God. What is God's favorite color? If he had one, I think they're all his favorite color. What do you need? And so he said, well, I don't know where do I go to get this information? The word of God. Well, so much there. So it's like reading the manual. I, you know, you see these manuals that are three inches thick. I don't want to read all that information. Some of it's kind of dry. Well, you know, we need to get to know the character, the person of God. The person of Jesus, what he wants for me, what he wants for my life, what he wants for your life. We need to get to know that. That helps that relationship. And one thing that we do know for sure is he wants us to be obedient to his will. Just like Jesus was obedient to his will. Now, this authority... For Jesus to grant eternal life could not happen until his glorification. Couldn't do it. You say, well, wait a minute. 
Didn't he say the, to the, 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 the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise? It could be done to the glorification. He said that knowing that he was going to be glorified. <laughs> Had the glorification never taken place, then that thief would have never gone to paradise. John chapter 5 and verse 24 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in them, who sent me, has eternal life. This is Jesus talking. And shall not come into judgment, but pass from death into life. That's what we want to do. We want to pass from death into life. Eternal or everlasting life it is an important theme in John's gospel. It is mentioned at least 17 times. Eternal life is God's free gift to those who obey his word. John chapter 6 and verse 47 Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, who, who believe, he who believes in me has everlasting life. We see in John 10 and verse 28, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And, and so this eternal life, this everlasting life is something that we want, we need, and Jesus has authority to grant it, he has authority to give it, and we ask the question, what is this eternal life? We look at knowing God personally, as we talked about. Not just knowing about him, but knowing him, having that relationship with him. John chapter 14 and verse 6 and following says this. This is a, a passage that where Jesus has his inner circle, his, his apostles and and, and he's basically said, well, I'm going away. And, oh, what do you mean you're going away, Jesus? Says, Don't be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You believe also in me and my Father's house are, are many mansions. And I go to prepare a place for you. And then he says this as you go down to verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So in other words, there's no other way to get to, to heaven. There's no other way to God except through Jesus. That's our only way. Verse 7 says, if you have known me, you would know my Father. And in other words, they're very much alike. They're, they're cut from the same cloth, so to speak. If you have a relationship with Jesus, and then your relationship with God seems like it, it might be pretty good. And, and from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I not been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who sees me has seen the Father, so how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? There's that relationship between God and Jesus. They're, that they're one and the same, if you will. It might be just like looking in the mirror and seeing Jesus. They, they expect the same things from us. They would act the same way. They're one but two individuals. The words that I speak to you, Jesus says, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the works. In other words, it, Jesus says this, You've heard me talking. You've, you've heard the, the works I've said. You've heard everything I said. Okay, now that's not me. That's who? That's the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you have a relationship with me, you've had a relationship with the Father. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works of themselves. 
So when I look at John 17, I know my relationship, my part of eternal life is my relationship with Jesus and God the Father. And you're not going to be a, a different relationship to know God. And this gospel means to know him by living in a reverent, believing, loyal relationship to him so that in actual life one knows him as the Father and knows the Son as the Savior and Lord. It means more than knowing the way to live. It's life itself. Well, thirdly this morning, we see this glorify or glory, glory to the Father and glory to the Son. When you bring glory to one, it just seems like you're bringing glory to the other. Verses 4 and 5 of John chapter 17 say this. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Now what did, what did God give Jesus to do? Well, first of all, how did he glorify him? He glorified by, by making his name good, by not sinning. And he's done what he's come to do, to, to live on the earth, to, to, to understand how humans think and act and, and face temptation, temptations and trials and, and different things and, and not sin. Says, and now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory. Watch this. With the glory which I had with you before the world was. Well, before you came to this earth, before you, you and I were, were born, before you and I were thought of, before Adam and Eve were, God and Jesus were up in heaven. You know, Philippians talks about this quite a bit, how, how Jesus, Philippians chapter 2, how Jesus came and, and, and humbled himself. And when he came to the death, it was, he, he humbled himself, he, even to the point of death on the cross, which was saved for the worst criminals. So now we're looking at the end of it. We're looking at glorification. Jesus came throughout his soldier on earth was to bring glory to God. Here he said that, that he had completed the mission which, for which God had sent him. I have glorified you on the earth. John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. So, so early on he knew that he had to finish the work. He had to bring glory to God's name. John chapter 5 and verse 36, But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. So the work that the Father had given him to do had its focus on the cross. And as Jesus said on the first occasion when he announced that his hour had come. Now that his earthly ministry was complete. Coming to a close, Jesus prayed for the Father to glorify him with the glory that he had enjoyed with the Father before the world was. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In other words, you have situation in the beginning where you have Christ and God. John chapter 13 and verse 32 if God is glorified in him God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. 
So another way of expressing Jesus' final exaltation to the right hand of the Father of the throne. We see descriptions in the Bible of what heaven kind of looks like, what heaven is kind of in. The one we just looked at in John chapter 14, um, don't let your heart be troubled. I believe in God, you believe also in me and my Father's house are many see mansions or, or rooms or, or abodes, depending on what version you're reading. And, and so we know when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. We, we know it's a wonderful place. It's a place that we want to spend time. It's a place that we want to go. It's a place of rest. It's a place where, where we have the glory of God. We have the glory of Jesus. We see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 33, an interesting verse, if you will. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. So now we're looking after the fact, after John's prayer had closed, after he died on the cross, after he had, he had been buried, after he rose from the dead. Then there was 40 days on this earth where he walked around and after he rose from the dead and talked to people and he saw um, Paul would say over 5,000 at one time, and, and then he ascended up into heaven. We see in Acts chapter 1, why? Standing gazing the same Jesus who went up into heaven will come again in like manner. And, and, and as they, they marvel that as he ascends up into heaven, when we have 10 days to go past in Acts chapter 2, and the church has started in Acts chapter 2, therefore being exalted, verse 33, to the right hand of God. Where is he now? Where is he in Acts chapter 2? Where is he when the church started? He's been exalted. He's back where he started. He's back at the right hand of the throne of God. He received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He, he poured out on which you now see and hear. So when the church started, they're hearing the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, now, we see God's attention, or, or I should say Christ's attention in Acts chapter 7, verse 55. But being full of the Holy Spirit, this is when they, when, Pete, when Stephen, one of the deacons chosen, was preaching. And they didn't like what he said when he was preaching, and they decided to stone him. He called, he called them stiff neck, which in their language meant stubborn. Um, they didn't like it, so they picked up stones and decided to stone him, and stone him to death even. And, and see in verse 55, but he, being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven. What did he see? He saw the glory of God, God glorified, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. You might say, well, why was Jesus standing? Because this poor treatment of preacher was enough to get Jesus' attention. So obviously he was at the right hand of God, glorified. But because of what was going on to Stephen, he stood up and got Jesus' attention. Glorify your son that your son might glorify you. His authority to grant eternal life. What a wonderful thing that is. We can look at that and, and, and know that, that Jesus can grant that to us. And, and what's the condition there? Knowing. Having that relationship with God the Son and God the Father. To know them. Not, not just to know them when we come by and walk by and say, hey, how are you? But to know them, have that relationship where Jesus is in my life and God is in my life and I know they're in my life and they're in my heart and, and they know what's going on and I know what's going on with them and, and it's a close-knit relationship. Now, now, this is written in the Greek, but if you translate it over into the Hebrew in the Old Testament, this is what they use when a husband knew their wife in the Old Testament. That's that relationship that we have with Jesus. This morning, if you're not in that relationship with Jesus. Why not? Not just the how you doing. I met you once. I met you twice. I know you a little bit, Jesus, but that I have that relationship with Jesus. If you're ready to become a Christian, why not this morning? 
Why don't we baptize into Jesus Christ, beginning that relationship with him, <coughs> believing that he is the son of the living God. Or maybe you need to come closer to God and we'll help you, we'll pray for you, pray with you. Why don't you come as you stand? Jesus is tenderly calling the home, calling to opportunity that we've had together together to worship your high and holy name. We pray, Father, that as we leave here that you'll be with each of us, that you'll give us safe passage to our destinations. We pray, Father, that as we go about our lives that you will guide us, help us always, Father, to carefully consider it before we act or speak. We pray, Father, that you will forgive us where we've sinned against you. And we we'll pray, Father, that when our lives here are over, we might have that happy home with you in heaven. And it's through Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.